sorry when I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry when 
And I just sang another song So take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you Oh, I'm sorry When I've come with my agenda I'm sorry God, you're enough. Oh, take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. God, open your presence. Oh, I just want to see. Caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings But Jesus, you don't owe me anything oh,
You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Amen. So uh, I guess first, little kids, uh, you're dismissed to Children's Church. Uh, those waving flashy wands in the back, uh, just follow those ladies and they'll get you taken care of there. Um, so this is the um, partner service where we take communion. And I just want to remind us of the simple gospel behind uh, why we take communion and just the symbolism behind that. So uh, through Adam, sin entered the world and our communion with God was broken. Therefore, all are far from God. Our sin has separated us from God and we were lost without hope. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The law was then given only showing us how great and deep our sin reaches. When Psalm 53 states, everyone has turned away all have become corrupt. There was no one who does good, no, not one. In our fallen state, God became flesh, Jesus. Born of a virgin, lived and kept every single part of the law, suffered and died on a cross for the atonement of our sins to please the wrath of God for those who call upon the name of the Lord. Jesus made one perfect sacrifice on the cross and it will never have to be offered again. The blood is not continuing to be shed the body is not continuing to be broken. When Christ said it is finished, he meant it. Now we can look with confidence to the promise in Romans 8 saying, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So let that be a reminder to us today while we take communion. If you're a believer, if you're a Christian, we have stations in the front and in the back uh, for you to come at your leisure. I urge you to remember the simplicity of the gospel and why you are saved. It's not through anything that you've done. It's not through any good work that you can uh, summon up in your life. It's only through the death of Jesus Christ and believing in him that we can have eternity with God. And, uh, and if you're not a believer here this morning, I urge you to come to Christ, to repent of your sins to turn away from your old life and to believe in him. Because scripture says he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, we thank you for, for the death of Christ and, and how Christ has paid for our sins in full. Lord, as we come to your communion table, let us remember that it is a weighty thing. Let us not take it lightly, Lord, as we take the juice and the cracker. May we remember Christ's blood that was shed, his body that was broken on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh-huh. 
hundred billion galaxies are born In the vapor of your breath the planets form If the stars were made to worship so
for this beautiful Sunday morning, that we are all alive today, and that we serve a holy God, a great and holy God who is worthy of praise and worship. I pray that you speak your message through Pastor Brandt and that you speak to every individual in this room. And we love you. You know, pray. Amen. Church, you can have a seat. Welcome to church this morning. Thank you for being here. I want to welcome everybody joining us online today as we continue on uh, week 11 in our Heaven series. If you haven't had the opportunity to join us over the last uh, 10 weeks, I want to encourage you to go uh, to our, our website or you can go to Facebook or you can go to our app and you can catch up on those topics. We've, taught, we've covered some pretty uh, important topics that People have questions about uh, regarding heaven. And uh, today I'm going to talk about probably some of the hardest topics that we've talked about uh, so far in this series. Uh, the, the whole question of what abouts is something that, that we've tried to cover a lot of during this series. What about people who, what about situations, what about, what about, what about? I think a very important theological concept that we need to talk about today or a couple different concepts are the concepts of children who die in heaven as well as people who take their own lives. And so this is going to be heavy today and, and so be forewarned of that. Uh, but we're going to dig into some scripture today and we're going to talk about some important things. The first question I want to talk to you about today is what about children who die? What about children who die who are old enough to communicate but young enough to not be able to fully grasp what the gospel means, to understand what sacrificial atonement is uh, most three-year-olds don't understand? And so we're going to talk about that today. But before we go there, I want to talk to you about the fact that I never want anyone to come to Celebration Community Church and not understand what salvation is, not understand what it takes to spend eternity in heaven, not understand what it means in our, in our jargon to be saved. And there are key verses in the Bible, I'm going to read just a few of them here, that we go over again and again and again because I never want anyone to be in the dark about what it really means to be a Christian. In Romans 1, verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. So if you're not Jewish and you're here, you're listening to this online, you're a Gentile. Okay, that's what Gentile means, non-Jew. Okay. In John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, it says, Yet to, to all who did receive him, to those, there's that word again, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. Did you notice what those two passages have in common. It's this word believe. And when you read believe in these passages, I want you to replace that with the word. I don't think that this is blasphemy or, or irreligious to replace that with trust. Because if you look at, at, at this word that we use for believe, we tend to think of believe in the existence of. 
okay? Uh, God does not just ask you to believe that Jesus was a person, that Jesus lived on this earth, but to put our trust in him. So when we see believe, it means in its translation to put our trust in, okay? John 3, 16 through 18, and most of you know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. And then it goes on to say, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. And then there's Romans 10. This is maybe the second most used passage when people are describing to others what it means to be saved. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved for it is with you, your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So we can read those verses right there and we can explain them to a three-year-old or a four-year-old or a six-year-old and there's a very good chance that they're not going to comprehend what this means. To expect a small child to understand an invisible God, to understand a God who sent his one and only son who's still God to earth for the forgiveness of sins and somehow that the blood cleanses, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin, that's, that's a pretty high level thinking for a little child. Now there's this term that's been used over the decades, I don't know, maybe over the centuries in the church called the age of accountability. And the age of the accountability is the age that a child comes to that no longer do they have an excuse for not understanding, but they need to make a decision to follow Christ or to reject Christ, right? The age of accountability. And there's churches out there who like set a specific number, of the age of accountability. Some churches will say 13 is the age of accountability. So other churches will say, well, eight is the age of accountability. Well, we know that the human brain does not develop from one child to another child exactly the same, right? So there are probably four-year-olds who could understand the gospel and there are seven-year-olds that can't. And so this whole idea of age of accountability, yeah, there's, there's, a, a, there's a point in time, I'm sure, not known by man. And, and this is why it's so important for parents and grandparents to share Christ with small children from an early age. Okay? So we come to this question of what about these kids that aren't yet old enough to understand the gospel? Are they condemned? Well, there's a passage that I want to point you to. If you have your Bible, turn to 2 Samuel. In the Old Testament, if you're new to your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. So it's kind of towards the beginning of your Bible. Chapter 12 of 2 Samuel. We see with some background here that David, King David, uh, started out as a shepherd boy and a musician that helped calm the king, king's nerves, right? He goes and he fights Goliath. Soon after that becomes a mighty warrior in Israel to the point of being uh, chosen to be king of Israel. So the second king of Israel. And he is this dynamic, famous person, the most famous person in all of Israel. And he ends up giving into temptation and having an affair with a woman named Bathsheba impregnating her and this child comes along. And that is where we're going to pick it up right here. Verse 16, David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and spent the nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused and he would not eat food with any of them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought while the child was still living, he wouldn't listen to us when we spoke to him. How can we now tell him the child's dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his attendants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead? He asked. Yes, they replied, he's dead. 
Then David got up from the ground. After he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes, he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request, they served him food, and he ate. His attendants asked him, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? Watch this. I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Did you catch a huge theological statement right there in that last verse? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. It's an assumption on this passage very clearly that David knows that when that child died on this earth, it was taken to heaven to be with God. If you are here today or listening to this message and you have lost a child, that is unimaginable pain. If you think about Jesus and the way that he interacted with children, you see in Matthew chapter 18 or chapter 19, and I believe it's Luke chapter 20, uh, Jesus interacting in one specific time where Jesus was teaching and all these children were, I'm paraphrasing, ch children were running around and the disciples were like, hey, get the kids out of here. Quit bothering Jesus. And Jesus stops everything right there. And he said, no, no, no. He put the children on his lap and he said, let the little children come to me for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those such as these. Children had a special place in Jesus' heart. If we think about the attributes of God, man, we could, we could spend all day long listing the attributes of God, but one of the attributes of God that the Bible is so clear about time and time again is that God is very full of justice. God is just. Just means fair. And so knowing that we serve a just God, a fair God, in fact, we serve a God that's far more than fair, isn't he? Because do we have anyone in here who's a sinner, who's been forgiven? That's more than just because I deserve hell. And yet God sent his son Jesus to save me and to save you. And so we don't get what we deserve. God is more than fair with us. So if we serve a God that is just, if we serve a God that is righteous, as it says in Psalm 89, 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. So the very essence of God is love. God is is a just God. And based on the character of God, God's mercy is shown to those children who haven't had the capacity to receive Jesus as their Savior. Charles Spurgeon, famous theologian, I love Charles Spurgeon's stuff. He says, I know or I rejoice to know that the souls of all infants, as soon as they die, speed their way to paradise. Think what a multitude there is of them. Isn't that cool? Think what a multitude of them there is. Which leads us to another question. We've talked about children who are old enough to communicate or understand some things. What about children who are never born or children who are stillborn, children who are aborted, children who are the result of a miscarriage, or children who are stillborn? What about them? I think we need to bring in another topic when it comes to them because there's this 
theological concept of the body and the spirit. And you've probably heard me say, I didn't make it up, it's said all over the place and attributed to different people. We, we are not bodies with a soul, we're souls with a body. And so it's important that we recognize that in God's eyes, which is the only truth, that at conception, we have a body and a spirit, okay? Psalm 139 is, is my favorite passage to go to. If you've, if you've never really studied Psalm 139, the whole psalm is incredible. And it says, starting in verse 13, for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. You knit me together. Cell by cell, God created every single human. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. That's kind of funny saying that, right? Right? God, you did good on me, right? Your works are wonderful. Just look at me, Lord. How often do you feel that way? My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes, watch this, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be before we were ever born, God knew us intimately. Let that soak in for a moment that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, there are a lot of people I know in this room who have gone through the hurt and the pain of a miscarriage. My wife and I are included in that group and, and we cannot wait to see our little girl in heaven. And I know a lot of you are, are struggling with fertility issues and a lot of you have, have had that pain of being excited about a pregnancy and about a child only for that pregnancy to not go to term. And people have a hard time understanding the pain that parents feel in that. There's also, if we go by statistics, people here who have been affected by abortion. And there's people here who have made, um, in, in an act of desperation, that decision to abort a baby. And, and I want to speak to you for a second that, that you have a forgiving God that loves you and has that child waiting for you in heaven. And I just want to encourage you today and let you know that there's nothing you've ever done that would remove you from God's love and he loves you and he wants to restore you and he will forgive you and he does forgive you if you've asked him to. And so he wants you to forgive yourself. The devil likes to take us and make us feel guilty about our worst sins that we would never wanna stand on this platform and share with everyone. And he knows that as long as he can keep his thumb on you and keep you from forgiving yourself, you can't fully understand the forgiveness of Christ. But there is forgiveness. What age are these children in heaven? I have no idea. I don't know. I'm going to share some intriguing stuff with you here in a couple weeks. In two weeks, I'm going to talk about near-death experiences. And I, and, I, and I will say this again in a couple weeks, but God's word has to be our ultimate resource, right? Um, but God has given people some pretty incredible stories and, and they've claimed to catch glimpses of heaven. And I'm going to be really careful when I, when I talk about that to make sure that, that you know that I'm not presenting you with gospel. I'm presenting you with people's experiences that, that there's some pretty cool things um, that, that people have experienced or say they've experienced uh, about heaven. And, and they talk some about children and the age of people there. We don't know from the Bible how old we'll be in heaven, right? There are some theologians that su suggest we'll all be 30 because 30 is supposed to be like the perfect age of health and, and all of this. And you know, I, yeah, I'd, I'd go back to 30. <laughs> some of you are like, amen, right? Some of you are like, I thought 30 was old. So it seems to be pretty clear and evident by Scripture and in line with God's character and grace and mercy that children, that babies, that the unborn are ushered into heaven. 
I think the same reasoning would apply, and again, I have to be careful, but I, but I think going with God's character, I, I believe the same would apply to people who have um, mental disabilities that are not able to fully understand the gospel. Um, again, going to what we're capable of. I, I believe that, and I can support this with scripture, I believe that God will hold us accountable for what we know, um, which could be really good news. And it could be really bad news. And we live in a country where uh, I know that there are people in our country who have never heard what the gospel really means, uh, but the majority have heard it. It's just that a lot have chosen not to do anything with that knowledge. But what about people who take their own lives? Now, there are very few people probably here today who have not been affected um, by someone who has taken their life. I had someone walk out of the service last night and said, I needed to hear that my brother took his own life. More and more people are being affected by this. Suicide's always been around. I think the church has done a poor job over the years of, of talking about it, um, along with mental health. Um, but you think about people who take their own lives. They're not all heathens. They're not all people who don't love the Lord or know the Lord. There are a lot of people who are Christian people who have made that tragic mistake of taking their own lives. I want to make sure that I in no way glorify suicide. And Suicide is murder. The Bible is very clear about murder being a sin. And, and suicide is self-murder. Um, there are people who commit suicide who are, who are under the influence of something and they make a knee-jerk reaction that ends their life. I had that experience with someone that I know here recently. There are uh, people who, uh, who are in situations in their life that they feel are hopeless. And even if they're a Christian, they, they momentarily at least forget that, that Jesus is the hope and that he promises to be with them through everything. There are people who take their own life because they're in a, uh, an immense amount of physical pain. There's people who take their own life in, in war situations when they're captured by the enemy. There are those who have mental health crises and are not able to think clearly and who make that tragic mistake. All of these scenarios, they're, they're sin because they're murder. Do you believe, and I do, and I will always believe this and I will always teach this from this pulpit, that God is the one who should be given the right to give life and take life away? That is a core doctrine of the Christian faith that I will not tiptoe around, that it is God's job to give life and it is God's job to take life away. Murder is a sin that the devil loves. Um, there was a murder in Hayes last night. It, 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 it's crazy what's happening in our world. Crazy what's happening in our world. Crazy the suicide rates that are taking off, but the devil loves murder. And the reason the devil loves murder is because the devil is a murderer. It says that in John 8, it says, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding the truth for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And the devil wants to convince you and wants to convince people in this world that their lives are not worth living. So murder obviously is a sin and murder obviously is not God's will for our life. But there's this whole question that people have of, well, is murder, is self-murder forgivable? And there are people who go down this line of thinking that says, well, 
We are to confess our sins to God. And if you murder yourself, then there is no opportunity after that to ask for forgiveness. So therefore, that's a fast track to hell. If that were true, then we would have to change all of these verses that I read to you at the beginning of this message. Let me go, let me go back to them, some of them. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent or of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. Does, does your Bible say, unless one takes their own life? Does your Bible say, but in this situation? Does it have an addendum in it that states a sin of a saved person that is not forgiven? Another tenet of the Christian faith, another non-negotiable in Christianity is that God, that Jesus died for all of our sins. Okay, would all of our sins include the sins that you committed yesterday? Absolutely. What if you forget about a sin and you have not yet confessed that sin and repented for that sin? Are you damned? Are you condemned? If that's the case, we should all be scared, right? Because I would guess, I would guess that if you're like me, there are sins that you've committed that you haven't specifically for that one sin on that one day during that one minute that you have committed, that you have forgotten or not asked for specific forgiveness for that sin. That is a very slippery slope theologically, very slippery I use this illustration, if you're heading down the road after church and God forbid you get hit by a semi and your life ends and the last thing that comes out of your mouth is using God's name in vain and you don't even think about it, it just happens, are, are you condemned? If that's the line of reasoning, then we all need to be in a constant state of fear and worry that whatever sin was not condemned. Because if you've lusted, if you've thought, a, a, an evil thought against somebody, if you've held on to resentment and unforgiveness towards somebody that hurt you five minutes ago, that's scary. Jesus died for all your sins. If you have committed your life to him, he has forgiven every one of your sins. Now, we are still, now don't, don't miss this, we are still to repent our sins. We are still to talk to God about those areas we've fallen short. The Bible says we've all fallen short of the glory of God, his perfect standard. And we will, unfortunately, never reach perfection on this earth. We will all have sin in our lives, hopefully less and less and less, because, you know, honestly, as you're growing in your faith in Christ, your sin should become less and less and less and less. And sin should not only be something that you think about, but something that really bothers you to the point of you want to be more Christ-like so you take care of that sin in your life. So we should, as we grow in our faith, we should grow up and our sins should become less, right? So whether it's murder, whether it's thinking an evil thought about somebody, it's important that we realize Jesus died for all of our sins even murder. I want to, I want to take you to another passage in Matthew chapter 12. This will take what I just said to you, which I understand is a, is a pretty bold statement that God even forgives murder, even self-murder. And again, not condoning that, and I'll get to that in a minute. But Jesus talks about one sin that's unforgivable, and it's not murder. One sin, in this, this section in the Bible in Matthew chapter 12, it catches a lot of people off guard when they first get into the word of God, and it confuses them, and honestly, it scares a lot of people, and we're gonna put that, that fear to rest today. 
In Matthew 12, starting in the 30th verse, Jesus said, Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin, I'm going to say that again, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. But blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, that's Jesus, will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. There are people who say, wow, so we can speak against one part of the Trinity and still be forgiven when we change our mind about Jesus. But if we speak against the Holy Spirit... Now, I don't get that. That doesn't seem to make sense. Well, we have to know what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. And and to put it simply, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is, is a permanent hardening of the heart that's irreversible towards God. A permanent hardening of the heart that's irreversible towards God. So if you're sitting here today and you are open to the gospel, and you haven't completely rejected Jesus irreversibly or the gospel irreversibly, you can take a deep breath because you haven't committed the sin of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But that's the only sin that the Bible says won't be forgiven. There's nothing in the Bible that signifies that taking one's own life is condemnation to hell. So why would we not want to just escape this evil world? Because let's just be honest, some of us, we got lives that are hard. And and I know we can always compare it to other countries and other people, and there's always somebody who has it worse. But but if we're real honest, a, a lot of people here today, you've gone through some really difficult hard things in your life. And unfortunately, this world is not going to get easier and it's not gonna get easier to be a Christian. So why would Christians not just drink the Kool-Aid and get it over with? Well, there's several reasons. The first reason we've already covered, it's a sin. It's a sin. Another reason is it's not God's desire for your life because he has a plan for your life. You know, I've never been to a funeral or done a funeral for a person who has taken their own life where the focus is on God, but instead it's the focus on the person who took their own life. It's not that God's not talked about. But, but let me give you my opinion for a minute. I don't believe that at the service of a, of a person who takes their own life, the gospel, I, I've never done a funeral where I haven't presented the gospel. And I'm going to present the gospel whether they're Christians or not Christians. I will always present the gospel and salvation uh, to people uh, at, at funerals. But what I've noticed is that at funerals where people die of natural causes or of sickness, or even, and and maybe even especially in unexpected accidents, those are when people who are at the funeral are most receptive to the gospel because they're thinking someday that's going to be me, and I don't know how soon that's going to be. And people, I say this at, at most funerals I do, Nobody goes to a funeral and doesn't think about their own mortality. But if it is a a funeral of someone who has taken their life, it's harder to go there because people are so full of mourning towards the person and they're not thinking about the fact that's going to be them someday because it wasn't an accident. To take one's own life cuts short what God has intended Remember a few weeks ago, I said one of our goals, one of our primary goals as Christians should be to make heaven crowded. Remember that? Uh, To take other people to heaven with us, to to give others the opportunity to see light in us and to receive Christ themselves, which would change their entire eternity, right? 
That's a pretty big deal. That's a, a pretty big calling that God has on every one of our lives. Whether you say, I've got the gift of evangelism or not, God has put a calling on your life to point people to him. No matter what you do for a job, no matter what kind of education you have, no matter how many friends you have, God is calling you to be a light to this world. You are the light of this world. The city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nobody takes a light and hides it under the bed, but instead they put the light on a lampstand in order for others to see the light. We can't be a light if we put out our light. One more time, it's God's job to decide when we're born and when we die. And those things should not happen outside of God's will. Tough topics. Next week, we're going to hit another tough, top, tough topic. What about adults, grown people in other parts of the world or in America who've never heard the gospel? What happens to them? We'll address that next week. It's a little different answer than today. Let's pray. God, thank you um, that you call us to talk about hard things. Even more so, we thank you for your grace and your forgiveness. Lord, I want, I want everyone here today to remember that for salvation, it takes a commitment to follow Jesus. And Lord, if there's anyone here today who's never made that commitment, may today be the day that says, Jesus, I've lived my whole life without you or I've turned my back on you. Today, I'm ready to, to get with it. Today, I'm ready to establish a growing relationship with you. I want the old me to be gone. I want the new me to be here. And I believe you can do that in my life, God. You are my only hope. You are our only hope. And we thank you for your graciousness and your patience with us. Lord, for the parents here today, I pray that you would give them a heavy burden, a heart burden to take every opportunity to share your love with their children. People you have called to be parent figures and grandparent figures, I pray that you would give a heart burden to share your love and your salvation with your precious children. Lord, we pray for those here who are hurting because of children they've lost through their own decisions or, or just because pregnancies didn't finish. Lord, I pray that you would give them comfort and peace and help them to remember that you're a God of mercy and grace and love and forgiveness. And thank you, Lord, that we will be reunited with those we have lost who had a relationship with you or who were covered by your grace, Lord. We praise you and thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen.